Stars up above me, stars in my eyes Fly up below me, starting to rise I'm my own captain, hanging on tight tonight Pointless to try and turn back the time I've never been this old in my life Load up my spaceship, tear through the sky, I might In the Bible, there are minor contradictions and major contradictions. A minor contradiction occurs in Proverbs 26 and when the Gospels record different words on the cross of Jesus. But if we ask the question, what events led to the crucifixion of Jesus, then we discover a major contradiction in the Bible. Mark tells us that Jesus rode into Jerusalem on a donkey, marched into the temple, and then incited a riot in an act of defiance. This riot inspired the chief priests and Pharisees to discuss how to eliminate the threat of Jesus, which resulted in the crucifixion of Christ. Matthew's gospel is slightly different. According to Matthew, Jesus rode into Jerusalem on a donkey and then incited a riot at the temple. But after the riot, he taught rebellious ideas in the shadow of the temple. Rather than the riot, these teachings led the chief priests and Pharisees to discuss the execution of Jesus, which later became the crucifixion of Christ. Luke takes the middle road between Matthew and Mark. In his gospel, Jesus rode into Jerusalem on a donkey, rioted at the temple, and then taught for days in the shadow of the temple. According to Luke, this combination of riot and teaching pushed the chief priests and Pharisees to discuss the elimination of Jesus, which eventually led to the crucifixion of Christ. While one may feel these distinctions result in a minor contradiction, the story of what led to the crucifixion of Jesus becomes a major contradiction when we read the Gospel of John. In the second chapter of John, Jesus traveled to Jerusalem and incited a riot at the temple during the beginning of his ministry. Jesus then left Jerusalem, preached the good news of God's kingdom for about two more years after the temple riot, and then miraculously raised his friend Lazarus from the dead. According to John, the resurrection of Lazarus threatened the chief priests and Pharisees, which inspired them to discuss the removal of Jesus. Shortly after the resurrection of Lazarus, Jesus rode a donkey into Jerusalem and then was eventually crucified. So when we ask the question, what events led to Jesus Christ being crucified? The correct biblical answer is, well, that depends on who you ask. This feels like a particularly dangerous answer in the era of misinformation. If an American today asks the question, was the American Civil War fought over slavery? And the response that is given back is, well, that depends on who you ask. Then a false reality where white supremacy is absent from America's history is given unjust validation. The only acceptable response to the question, was the American Civil War fought over slavery, is yes. So why is it unacceptable to answer that depends on who you ask when discussing the American Civil War and entirely acceptable to answer that way when we discuss the Bible. To respond to that question, imagine a hypothetical scenario where you wake up one day and say to yourself, I want to look at some maps today. Your Wi-Fi is down, so you decide to get up, get out, and see what the world can offer to quench your cartographic thirst. You walk into a library and you ask the librarian if they have any maps of the United States. The librarian smiles at you and points you in the direction of the latest atlas. You admire the intricacy and detail as you realize that this paper holds all the information you need to get from where you are to Lecompton, Kansas. After appreciating the roadmap for a few moments, you thank the librarian and then you leave. A few moments later, you stop at a history museum. You walk over to a docent and you ask if this museum has any maps on display. The docent smiles and leads you to an exhibit on the Civil War. At the entrance to this exhibit, 
a large map details which states seceded from the Union and which states remained in the Union. You feel a little crestfallen at the hatred of white supremacy that this map represents. With a reverent tone, you ask the docent, was the Civil War fought over slavery? And the docent responds, of course it was. You thank the docent and leave the History Museum. From there, you travel a few blocks and arrive at the new art gallery in town. You walk inside and ask the curator on a whim, do you have any maps in this art gallery? The curator smiles and says, why, yes. Yes, we do. And she guides you over to a 20-foot high sculpture of televisions stacked on top of each other in the shape of the United States. Outlining each of the states are different colored fluorescent neon tubes that overwhelm your retinas. To add to the cacophony, each of the televisions flashes images from each of the states that they represent on the map. You aren't sure how you feel about this map, but after you leave the gallery, you cannot stop thinking about this map. A few days later, you tell your friends about your local expedition to look at maps. In hearing your story, your friend Claudia asks you, hmm, of all the maps you saw, which map was the most correct map? While this may seem like a strange question to be asked, we all know your friend Claudia, and this is exactly the kind of question she asks. After a moment, you say, well, Claudia, all three of the maps were the most correct because all three of the maps were shown to me in their proper environment. In fact, the only way for one of the maps to be incorrect is if someone placed that map in the wrong location. This is an important distinction to make. Imagine setting foot into the library and asking for a map to help you to get to Lecompton, Kansas. Rather than guiding you to an atlas, the librarian then instead points you in the direction of a map from the Civil War. While the city of Lecompton is technically on this Civil War map, this map would be almost useless in providing a route to Lecompton. The environment of the library renders the same Civil War map to be incorrect. Imagine walking into the art gallery and asking the curator to show you a map. The curator smiles and leads you to a well-lit display of a roadmap from an atlas. All of a sudden, the map is more of a statement as to what qualifies as art rather than being the expression of a human soul. This environment nullifies the original intent of the roadmap and causes the roadmap to convey ideas that it was never meant to convey. Lastly, imagine entering a history museum with the desire to see a map that can teach you about the Civil War. The docent then leads you down a long hallway to a giant sculpture of televisions and neon tubes resembling the outline of the United States. You scratch your head and ask whether or not the Civil War was fought over slavery, and the docent responds by telling you that the interpretation of the Civil War is more important than the concrete facts of the Civil War. Even though the map is the same, the environment causes the television map to become incorrect. This thought experiment reveals that the environment housing the map impacts our experience with the map. Keep that in mind as we return to the major contradiction of the events leading up to the crucifixion. Somewhere between the third to fifth century, several church councils created lists of writings to be included in the New Testament. These myriad councils continually listed Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, with all of their minor and their major contradictions as part of the biblical canon. They could have just picked one of these gospels and said, this one got it right. This one gospel has the indisputable truth. But instead, the church councils felt that multiple imperfect human perspectives more fully portrayed the life of Jesus than a singular unified authoritative narrative. Well, what kind of building contains multiple imperfect human perspectives? That's not a history museum. 
The great history museums exist to offer clarity and certainty about the events of the past. Incorrect facts displayed at a history museum sabotage the very reputation of that museum. However, an environment that celebrates multiple imperfect human perspectives is an art gallery. Art galleries welcome the diversity of the human experience. Notice how these crucifixion art pieces begin to speak about something deeper when viewed together. The differences between the pieces contribute to a collective beauty that is impossible from a singular viewpoint. These four paintings of the crucifixion call us back to the immense value of experiencing God through the diversity of our humanity. The four Gospels in the Bible are like four dynamic paintings hanging next to each other in an art gallery. This art gallery is how our Christian ancestors wanted us to experience the story of Jesus Christ today. In the foundation of our tradition lies a progressive idea that we can best comprehend the incomprehensible God when we are in community with each other. Over a thousand years after those councils, a handful of professors in New Jersey scrambled to retaliate against Darwin's theory of evolution. Going against the tradition of those church councils, these professors insisted that God could best be understood from a singular authoritative perspective. This doctrine moved the Bible from a theological art gallery to a theological history museum. And that theological environment completely changed our interaction with the scriptures, even though the scriptures stayed the same. Rather than celebrating the differences between the experiences of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, inerrancy squashed the human nature of each of these writings. Inerrancy insisted that all of the Gospels are saying the same thing. Inerrancy insisted that God can only be experienced in one way. Inerrancy insisted that Christians need to cover up the contradictions of Scripture rather than celebrate those same contradictions. Inerrancy insisted that a gallery full of the same painting by the same artists is a better way to understand God instead of a gallery filled with a diversity of artists and paintings. Have you ever felt that the Bible is boring? Maybe the boredom we feel is not from the content of the Bible, but instead from the theological structure that Christians built around the Bible. The major contradictions of the Bible dismantle the rickety edifice of inerrancy. From there, the major contradictions inspire us to embrace the Bible as an art gallery, brimming with multiple imperfect human perspectives. When we see the Bible as an art gallery, we are aligning ourselves with the radically progressive tradition of early Christianity. That the incomprehensible God is best comprehended through the wide and beautiful diversity of humanity. May we enjoy the beauty of the Bible as an art gallery.